Hi, everyone, and welcome to our live debate on the future of Canadian Confederation. I'm your host, Candace Malcolm, journalist, author, and founder of True North, and it is my sincere pleasure to be hosting and moderating this evening's debate on the motion, be it resolved, Alberta and Saskatchewan would be better off independent. This event is co-sponsored by True North Centre for Public Policy, which publishes the new site tnc.news, focused on Canadian politics and current affairs, as well as Civitas Canada, which is a society of intellectually minded Canadians who host conferences to talk about ideas. This event is part of the True North Speaker Series and also part of the Civitas Digital Salon Series. So before I move to introduce the issue and tonight's speakers, I'd like to poll our live audience to find out where everyone stands before the debate begins. So to our live audience members, there are two questions that I'm going to put to you to answer now. The first one is, do you support the motion? The motion, of course, is be it resolved, Alberta and Saskatchewan would be better off independent. Keep in mind, the motion does not ask what is best for Canada, but it asks what's best for Alberta and Saskatchewan. And the second poll question to our live audience is, depending on what you hear tonight during tonight's live debate, are you open to changing your mind? So we'll give everyone a bit of time to respond and answer those questions, and then we will reveal the results of these polls prior to the start of the debate. We are incredibly excited to be hosting this event. It's a very timely event, considering where we are as a country right now. We have a prime minister who seems committed to re-engineering our economy away from the industries that drive the prairie provinces and sees no limit on how much money he's willing to borrow and spend and no restraints on the power and the ability of the federal government to fix every single problem in the country, real or imagined. As was pointed out by Civitas members, Ted Morton, Tom Flanagan, and Jack Mintz in their new book, Moment of Truth, How to Think About Alberta's Future. And I just recently learned that uh, one of our speakers tonight, Barry Cooper, has a chapter in that book. Uh, this is what they said. They said, since 1960, Ottawa has taken a net $630 billion out of Alberta. Alberta's jurisdictions over natural resource development have been eroded by federal policy encroachments, such as Bill C-69 and the carbon tax. The predictable result, a collapse of investor confidence and a $100 billion exodus of capital investment from Western Canada. In Alberta, unemployment and bankruptcies have soared, unquote. Well, it's no wonder a February 2020 poll found that 78% of people in Alberta and Saskatchewan believe that Ottawa has lost touch with average people. Likewise, a survey conducted by the Western Standard in May found that 41% of Albertans stated they would either definitely or probably vote to secede. So while Laurentian elites ignore the issue and while my colleagues in the mainstream media deliberately paint the movement as fringe and in a negative light, the reality is an increasing number of public figures, including prominent business leaders, top academics, and popular politicians, are all beginning to advocate seriously for Western independence. So what is the future of Confederation? That's what we're here to talk about and discuss today. Uh, we have uh, to argue in favor of an independent Alberta and Saskatchewan. We have Dr. Barry Cooper. Barry Cooper is a professor of political science at the University of Calgary and a fourth generation Albertan. He studies classical and contemporary Western political philosophy and is the author, editor, or translator of 35 books. Here to argue against the motion for an independent Alberta and Saskatchewan is the Honorable Stockwell Day. Stockwell Day is former leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, leader of the Canadian Alliance Party, and former member of parliament, serving from 2000 to 2011. Before that, from 1986 to 2000, Mr. Day represented Red Deer North in the Alberta legislature, where he served in Ralph Klein's progressive conservative government in a variety of senior roles. So thank you so much to both of you for being here and for leading this important conversation. Tonight's debate will run for exactly one hour, minus the five minutes or so that I've been speaking here, and finishing at precisely 8 p.m. here in the Eastern Time Zone, which is 6 p.m. in Alberta and Saskatchewan, 5%, on, 5 p.m. on the West Coast. Each speaker will have 10 minutes to provide their introductory remarks, followed by five minutes each to respond to their opponent's remarks. 
It'll be followed by 10 minutes or so of open debate, and then we'll, we'll conclude tonight's debate with five minutes each uh, for closing remarks. Without uh, further delay, before we get to the before we get to the the debate, one one last thing. Sorry, let's let's reveal the results of the poll just to see what our live audience uh, is feeling. So on the question, uh, do you support the motion? We have 64% saying yes, they do, and 36% saying they do not support the motion. And then on the question of whether you're willing to change your mind, it looks like we have a pretty open-minded group here tonight. We have 84% of people viewing saying that yes, they are willing to change their mind. That's great. 16% are, are, are unwilling. And so w without further delay, let's, uh, let's move right to it. We'll, uh, Give it over to Dr. Barry Cooper for his 10 minute introductory remarks. Over to you, Barry Cooper. Well, thank you, Candace. Um, I'll begin from quoting the opening paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect for the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And then comes the part about uh, all men being created equal, uh, the unalienable rights of human beings that governments secure, and governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. And when governments are destructive of those ends, it is the right of the people to abolish it, even though, and this is another quote from the third paragraph, second paragraph, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such a government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. Now, when the Declaration was written, the colonies were still part of the British Empire. It is therefore a British more than an American document, and its provisions can be adopted with minor mo modifications by us. Particularly important then and now are the long train of abuses and usurpations. We all know about the tanker ban, the absence of pipelines. Uh, all this is very common knowledge. It's the tip of the iceberg, however. Canada is trying to impoverish Alberta. Uh, as Ted Morton said, my distinguished colleague, the problems are structural. They're not problems of bad policy. And in fact, it started long before Canada had anything to do with the West. That's a Bay Company lands were British plantation under the Imperial Crown. They were ruled from London. Without the consent of the inhabitants, whether they were First Nations or settlers or officers and employees of the company. Then came the transfer in the 1870s. It was not a purchase by Canada, although Canadians will often tell you that, the way the Americans bought Alaska. Louis Riel argued in 1870 that the company and the Imperial Crown had abandoned Red River. Canada thought otherwise, and in 1870, and then 15 years later, when it deployed military force to secure Red River Colony. My first point then is that Canada inherited British imperial, the British imperial approach to the West, and they have never let it go. Macdonald said we were a Canadian colony. Alexander Kennedy Isbister, a name that is probably known only in Winnipeg nowadays, uh, said we were a colony of a colony. To put it bluntly, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba were never provinces like the others. Certainly not in 1905, Certainly not in 1930 either, even if they were formally equal to the other provinces, but never substantively. And they have never been seen in Ontario and Quebec, in Laurentian Canada, as problems like Ontario and Quebec or even British Columbia. 
since the uh, significance of the long train of abuses and usurpations is probably pretty well known. And as Candace mentioned in Moment of Truth, uh, the, the new book that is actually out, I think now, by, uh, by Mintz uh, Morton or edited by Mintz Morton and Flanagan, uh, you can see this in, if you don't know about it, you can see it in, uh, in incredible detail. This explains why Alberta statutes were so frequently disallowed uh, or reserved in the 1930s under social credit. It explains the national energy policy. It explains the outright hatred for Stephen Harper by the Laurentian media. It explains the condescending attitudes of central, Alber of, of central Canada uh, when Alberta didn't vote liberal in 2019. So what is to be done? As Lenin said, Lenin's great question, what is to be done? Well, one thing for sure, Laurentian Canada has no interest ever in treating Alberta and Saskatchewan as normal provinces. They never have, they never will. They do not like us one little bit. And the reason is that we do not share the same image and vision of the country as Canadians do, Laurentian Canadians. We think of ourselves as citizens, not as colonials. Silly us. They don't see us that way. Another thing for sure, Laurentian Canada will never permit a renegotiation of the terms of confederation. Not even changes to section 36 of the Constitution Act of 18, 1982, which governs equalization, or rather the confiscation of Western wealth to be redistributed chiefly to Quebec. Uh, that's another example, another car in the long train of abuses. Nor will they ever negotiate under the terms of the Clarity Act. Read it sometime. It seems to indicate that a clear result on a clear referendum question will compel the government of Canada to negotiate. But who decides what's a clear question? The House of Commons. And it does so before any vote is taken. And who decides what a clear majority, if the House of Commons decides it's a clear question? Why? The House of Commons, of course. And it does so after the vote is taken. So the government of Canada has two vetoes. Ask yourself, do you think they will use them? Do you think they might even disallow any referendum legislation if Alberta and Saskatchewan pass such a document? The questions answer themselves. Of course they will. So now what? We'll go back to 1776. The colonies, the 13 colonies, had to rely on Spain and more on France for help. We will have to rely uh, on help too. And the only help available comes from the United States, whether we like it or not. Uh, we will have to get their assistance and then we can gain our independence. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry Cooper. And now for your 10 minute opening remark, over to you, Stockwell Day. Well, thank you, Candace, and thank you to True North and also to Civitas for putting uh, together a series like this. Uh, it's a great opportunity for all of us to really consider things that have pretty far-reaching consequences if we really want to put them to test. I want to say right from the beginning that the grievances that Albertans share and bear to this day are real, and I share them and I feel them. I mean, we can talk about um, the very founding of, of Canada constitutionally in 1967. It was the Liberals who dragged their feet, and it wasn't until 1905, as we know, that Alberta was even allowed in along with Saskatchewan. Uh, that was uh, deliberate foot dragging on the Liberal part. It was only when a Conservative leader, was opposition leader, was threatening to do something different that, we, that there was finally some action. So right from the beginning, there were bad feelings and bad memories beginning to be etched into the psyche of Albertans. Uh, Barry's already mentioned in the 30s, in a time of devastation, time of depression, when frankly the banking system was not helping out the West, was not helping out Alberta. Alberta came up with some some creative, controversial, but creative ways to try and help Albertans get through that crisis. And the federal government took unprecedented action. Uh, they, they actually activated a section of the Constitution, Section 56, that it, it's called the Disallowance Act, slamming Alberta for trying to 
uh, get ahead in some creative ways. In 1949, with the Alberta First policy, here again was the Alberta government trying to stave off the really the confiscation of the natural resources by export through federal policies at terrible low prices. They wanted to put in some restrictions of that again. The, and in that particular case, the federal government even openly talked about sending in the military to stop that. These are the types of things that are that are in our memories in, in Alberta and the children and the grandchildren now. And I was living in Alberta all through those years of the National Energy Program. I saw firsthand friends and neighbors and in, within my own family, complete and utter devastation and destruction. People losing their homes, people losing their businesses, people losing their lives, frankly. Uh, out of uh, suicide uh, because of the extremity of the situation. And again, no response in any kind of a meaningful way from the Liberals. And um, again, we see it repeated just a, a year, a little over a year ago. Here we have the um, provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan coming to the federal government and begging for a change. They weren't even demanding independence. They were just asking for a change in the equalization formula. Because we're in Alberta now completely devastated, not just in the oil and gas, now COVID added on top of it. And what does the prime minister say? Talk to me again in 2024. After how many more Albertans have been crushed, businesses lost, and absolute devastation continues. So uh, this all sounds like I'm about to agree with Barry that we've just got to plunge ahead and uh, separate and move to independence. Here's why I'm saying no to that and taking the other side of the resolution is because it's that type of appeal simply won't work. In the, in the worst of times for Quebec, after repudiation by the Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown Accord, other things that were taking place, and they had a strongly uh, sovereigntist movement within Quebec and a strong and, po and popular party. They pushed hard in 95. Never would there have been a greater time. And Quebec has always been the most open. Quebec has always been the most open to that type of direction. Now, it was close and it was dangerously close because of the neglect of the federal liberals, but it didn't work. Even in Quebec, which arguably could be the most open to separation, they couldn't get the vote. We won't get, you won't get the vote in Alberta, in my view. Now, I'm saying that not presumptively. I'm saying if the people moved in that direction, then I would hope the government, of course, would support it. This is a matter of the people's choice. But you're going to have to be honest with people and explain the difficulties in getting there, in getting to even the place where you could get a vote, first of all. Uh, Barry's already touched on between the Clarity Act and the Supreme Court decisions. Number one, the feds get to decide the question, if it's fair or not, they get to decide what percentage is going to result in a vote. And then you've got to go to the other provinces and you've got to convince them that the best thing to do is for Alberta and maybe Saskatchewan to leave. Um, you know, I, I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. And convincing the population of Alberta in its present constitution, constitutional the, the way it's set up, you're not going to do it. I appreciate Barry leading off with talking about and reading from the uh, Declaration of Independence and talking about the colonies. And I agree 100% with the princ those principles of freedom. But a growing cohort of voters in the 20 year old to 40 range, they will not countenance that kind of discussion, even in Alberta. As a matter of fact, there's a growing movement towards people are, are wanting, unfortunately, more reliance on government thanks to these some of the terrible policies from the federal liberals but you're not gonna to appeal to the voting population, an increasingly large one in Alberta uh, with that type of an approach. You can appeal if you talk about gaining more sovereignty, if I can use that word, by turning the economy around in ways that are still possible provincially. So if you're going to push for independence, you've gotta really be honest with people and tell them what they're looking at and tell them too that they're gonna to have to entertain questions, one of the pushbacks in Quebec on the independence question was when it hit them right in the face and caught them by surprise when it was presented to them that there were large numbers in Quebec who said, if the province of Quebec separates, we in certain regions in Quebec, then we want to separate from Quebec. And the point was made again in court that if Quebec is saying Canada is divisible, then they have to accept that the province of Quebec can be further divided by people who don't want to leave. So what if you did ever get to a vote in Alberta? And what if there were large sections, even though it might be a minority vote? For instance, what if Alberta 
uh, being split, let's say I'm, I'm being, uh, this is hypothetical, let's say Red Deer and North said, we want to stay. And Red Deer and South said, we want to go, we want out. And the South carried the day, let's say 55% of the vote. Are you prepared for the reality that there is a hint constitutionally at the Supreme Court that the upper half of Alberta could actually petition to stay in Canada? And what about First Nations? who wouldn't necessarily, some, some would want to leave. We've got, uh, Alberta probably has one of the largest uh, percentage of First Nations groups who are entrepreneurial, um, who, who move ahead on um, wanting to see development for their own people. So even within First Nations, I think you'd see a split. How are you going to deal with that? So if you're talking about a move to independence, you've got to be honest with Albertans about this. And I just don't think it's possible. Where there is possibility, is in what Jason Kenney is doing right now in saying if we don't get, if Alberta does not get certain changes made, then we definitely want to see a change in the equalization formula. We want to see that renegotiated. Now, I know uh, Barry said, and I, I appreciate uh, his views related to the Laurentian elite. I have those same concerns. It's one thing to hit them with, we're going to separate, and we're going to propose it, and we're going to see if you get on side. Uh, that would that would of course create opposition, and not just with the Laurentian elite. I believe across the country that Canadians, as miserably as they might feel they're being governed, and as horribly as they might feel they're being taxed, I just don't think they're ready to, as it were, toss in the towel. But people are more open to a discussion related to these formulas that can result in in monies properly going back to Alberta. I guess one of the positives about something that's negative is the complexity of that equalization formula. So start talking about that and a lot of people will just go away. And then if you've got people who are focused on it, you can get things done for Alberta. When I was Minister of Finance in Alberta, I worked very closely in, in interprovincial meetings with whoever was the Quebec Minister of Finance, Bernard Landry at the time. And we allied. We were able to ally against the uh, federal government and actually get some bona fide changes that were positive for Alberta. So the way forward is to really work hard in terms of the formulas and in terms of the return of capital to Alberta. And we do this not through sovereignty, but as, as Francois Legault, the present premier in Quebec, he has clearly said they have abandoned the notion of sovereignty because he you know most, knows most of his citizens don't want it. But he said, he said this, resolutely, we are moving to increased autonomy. We need to link arms, not just with that type of philosophy, but, but the type of things Quebec and others are doing. Increased autonomy can get some of these grievances addressed and hopefully move Alberta to better prosperity. We'll now move on to a more formal rebuttal. Uh, so, so we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Barry Cooper, for five minutes or so to, to directly respond to anything that you, you just heard uh, Stockwell Day say. Thanks, thanks, Yanis. Uh, Stock and I agree that the grievances won't go away. I think what we disagree uh, about is whether Canada is willing to address them. They have no interest in addressing them. Uh, we have tried everything. We have tried working within Liberal parties, uh, Laurentian parties, rather. Uh, we've started our own parties, we've worked outside, we've worked inside, nothing happens, nothing works. Secondly, and I, I don't see how you can avoid the conclusion that liberal policy has been deliberate, uh, and it is structural, as, as, uh, as uh, Ted said, uh, and it is historic. They want to destroy the Alberta economy. It's as simple as that. Uh, there was a joke back when Saskatchewan was in a very bad position. The last one out, please turn out the lights. That's the image that um, I think is motivating uh, so much of Laurentian, not just liberal, but mostly liberal policy. The second thing is, it's, it's not a question of law, really. It's not really a question of the Clarity Act. It, well, that'll never work. Um, it's a question of political leadership. Uh, I'm an optimist just like stock. I'm an optimist too. But I think eventually uh, Albertans and, and Saskatchewanians will be fed up, sufficiently fed up that they will demand uh, political leaders who actually do something that's realistic. Um, there are, of course, there are hypothetical differences. Uh, what would happen if people in Edmonton wanted to stay in Canada? The Americans and the 13 colonies 
faced those difficulties too. They even had rebellions, uh, the Shays' Rebellion, uh, shortly before the uh, when the Articles of Confederation uh, in the U.S. were still there. Um, the, the equalization formula, I mean, we can perhaps have a side wager on this. It will never be addressed by Laurentian Canada. They suck so much money out of this province, as everybody who's ever looked at it uh, has said, they, you think they're going to give that up? You, you remember the old cartoon uh, with the milk cow eating its hay in Alberta and getting milk uh, in Laurentian Canada. Uh, we have no allies really in Quebec. Uh, if we did, we wouldn't have had uh, the adamantine objection by the government of Quebec uh, to have a pipeline. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think, I mean, the, the idea of autonomy uh, is, is sort of like hemi-demi, what Eugene Force used to call hemi-demi-semi-separatism. Uh, uh, that won't work either. Eventually, Westerners will say, enough is enough. Uh, and we will, it may not be Jason Kenney. Uh, in fact, everything he said, it won't be. Um, but we will have somebody uh, who says, we have to leave. Uh, and if you and, and if the, uh, there's a, an option a, a, an option that's been that I thought about I don't think it'll work but uh, you have a referendum on uh, changing section 36 the equalization formula and if that is not addressed by Canada and it won't be then two weeks later you have a referendum on independence in order to do that you'd have to have it prepared by a political leader uh, who understands that the problems uh, are never going to go away. And they can only be addressed in one way with success. Uh, there was a, an absolutely wonderful article in the Roughneck magazine of just about a year ago that explains uh, how this can be done, what Alberta's negotiating position would be vis-a-vis -vis Canada, and why we would win. Uh, and I, it, I recommend you look it up. It's, it's uh, available on the internet. Um, it is very serious. Uh, from the point of view of Canada, it's a matter of of treason. It was a matter of treason for the 13 colonies. It was a matter of treason with Louis Riel. Uh, and that's not going to go away either. So it's serious. But like stock, I'm optimistic. We're just optimistic about different things. Well, there you go. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cooper. And now over to you, Stockwell Day. We'll do another five minutes uh, where you can directly respond to anything that uh, Barry has said. Great, thanks. Uh, Barry, always again, appreciate those uh, thoughtful remarks. Uh, respectfully, it didn't address some of the questions I raised. It will be a very real, you push for independence, you have to do it through a vote. Um, you, you, the, the reference, and I, and I always appreciate historic uh, references and a reflection on the past, we can learn from that. But uh, seriously, when I you know talk with uh, my grandkids or my kids and their friends, uh, if I even raise the notion of, you know, well, if Alberta wants to split, you know, some of the colonies did that. And so they took up arms against each other and they, and, and they, they, went, they went at each other uh, with the muskets. It's not going to fly today. It just, it just doesn't work. Um, when Quebec lost that referendum, uh, you remember the premier of the day in his, in his uh, petulance, uh, he, he blamed new Canadians in Quebec. Well, there's a lot of new Canadians in Alberta. And they love the notion of Canada. There's a lot of them are, are, you know, I've learned over the years, there's some pretty nasty stuff in terms of the economic deal we get, but they love the thought of Canada and they love Alberta and getting them from when you consider some of the war torn and uh, absolute poverty devastated areas of the world that so many of the uh, even new immigrant immigrants or even the new Canadians going back 25 years, they've come from they really appreciate and maybe more than Albertans and more than Canadians, what we do have here. So they're not gonna be willing to put that at risk in a fight, either a fight that's uh, literal or, or, or figurative. They are gonna to wanna to see, uh, for sure, they wanna see changes, but um, you're not gonna get them on side. You're not gonna get young people on side. So you can't pursue, in my view, this notion of independence or separatism if in fact, if you're gonna pursue it, you've gotta go all out. We'll pull out all the stops. That's a lot of energy and political strain in a time where we've got unemployed, in a time where we need to rebuild and we need to 
protect our industries. We need to protect our education system. We need to protect the ability to fund our social services. And you know, as a former minister of social services, um, I know what it's like to move people off of social services who shouldn't be there, but to increase benefits for people who need to be there. These are the types of sentiments that are going to grab people and we'll get the support of a provincial premier. In this case, I do think it's uh, Jason Kenney to push hard on these items. Look what's just been brought in in legislation in the last year or so um, to advance Alberta's uh, position. Uh, renewing the, uh, the Alberta Senate Act. Some say you'll never get any, any kind of Senate change. You almost had it at the Shardstown Accord. Um, Bill 26, bringing in referendum and, and restoring that. Um, a, a beautifully named act talked about preserving the Canadian Economy Act, which is going to uh, keep the ability of the feds to have influence in where our oil is going. And he's called it pres preserving the Canadian economy because in fact it will. And then look at provincial autonomy with his, uh, the, the Alberta Parole Act, uh, the Red Tape Act to reduce federal uh, footprints in our lives. Uh, the Royalty Guarantee Act so that all investments, especially from um, resource companies, they're, they're going to know what the royalty is for 10 years in a row, not this uh, back and forth from year to year. The Alberta Investment Act, there's some amazing things that are being talked about that's going to start attracting investment, believe it or not. So I close with this thought, uh, Barry and, and, and two others. Um, it was doom and gloom and, and pretty well the end of the world in the early 90s when uh, Ralph Klein won the election, an election many thought he wouldn't win. And we put in, uh, under his leadership, uh, policies were put in place that had never been seen before in Canada and it never worked. Well, we did see a reduction in the cost of civil service. We got a smarter civil service out of it. We did see actual uh, approaches that you can reduce a deficit in a way that will allow you eventually to lower taxes. Lowering taxes brings in more investment. More investment allows you to take care of real needs in education and in social services. There was a buffet of legislation and then the successful working out of it that actually caught the attention of other provinces. The province of Ontario, and I know some, in the, some won't like this, but um, under uh, Mike Harris at the time on the economic side, they followed many of what uh, those policies Alberta put in. And then other provinces started to follow. And one after another, because Alberta was showing that proper and virtuous policies can work, it actually began to change the face of the country. Even look at all the provinces that brought in um, uh, set term elections, and it actually went to the federal level. Now, these things go up and down, they go in cycles, and some of that has waxed and some of it has waned. But for, as we uh, like, like to say, for um, a not too brief and shining moment, Alberta was really changing the rest of the country because we started doing things the way we thought they should be done. We've got to stay on that course, We've got to vigorously uh, uh, push forward on this referendum that uh, Kenny is talking about in terms of equalization. We can do it. So rather than uh, go down a road that is going to cause, uh, I don't mind stress and, hard way, uh, and, heart, and heartache, but if it's not going to be victorious, then it won't be. It's just devastation. I'd rather be the, the shining city on a hill that Alberta has been in the past and change the country that way. Great. Thank you so much, Stockwell. We're now going to move to sort of a more open uh, debate format where for the next 15 minutes or so, uh, you, you can just, you know, go, go ahead and, and directly respond to anything one other said. And, and if you need, uh, I've got a bunch of questions that, that I'll throw in as well if, uh, if, if the uh, conversation starts running up. So, uh, Barry, did you want to did you want to take a, a response to what Stockwell has said here? Well, I'll, I'll save it for the last uh, thing. Uh, there, uh, we agree on, on a, a great number of things. Uh, certainly, there's plenty of room for change in the government of Alberta. Uh, but, uh, and we agree entirely, I think, on, on that. Well, one of the questions, uh, Barry, that, that, that I keep hearing and, and that uh, Dr. Roy Eapen, who's, who's in the Q&A here, he asks that even if Alberta did separate, they would still be landlocked. So uh, maybe you could walk us through how becoming an independent or separate country would actually help Alberta get its resources to market, get pipelines built, and, and actually be a successful independent country? Um, the suggestion that was made in that uh, article that I referenced in, in the Roughneck magazine, which is kind of a, um, a lot of people may not have heard of it. It's, it's a kind of service uh, magazine for the, for the oil, and, uh, oil and gas industries published in, in Calgary here. Uh, the argument basically was 
um, Canada is so in debt, uh, and it's in debt to this province in particular because of, of the, the uh, amount of money that you cited at, at, right at the beginning, that we can do a land for debt swap. And the border between Canada and Alberta will be at Hope in BC. It's a nice choke point. The Fraser Valley goes into the canyon. Uh, the Coquihalla ends in Hope. And the Hope-Princeton Highway ends in Hope. Uh, so the Lower Mainland and uh, Vancouver Island will be parts of Canada, like um, Kaliningrad is in, in, uh, uh, in Eastern Europe. And the deal will be that Alberta will have Canada over a barrel because uh, if they're not willing to uh, do some kind of debt for land swap, um, the Canadian dollar will be in free fall. Uh, Alberta is what makes uh, Canada at the moment pretty much a first world country. Uh, and if that's gone, then Canada is, is a basket case. It's no longer, it won't be an honorary member of the third world. It'll be a member of the third world. Uh, it's a Wall Street Journal uh, remark about, about five years ago, 10 years ago. So that gives us access to the ocean. Uh, and I will guarantee you that within about two years, uh, there will be a Northern Gateway uh, into Prince Rupert. It'll happen in a blink of an eye. Question for you, Stockwell. Uh, so some of the things you mentioned, you know, changing the uh, equalization formula. I mean, we had Stephen Harper in government for almost a decade and they didn't, that government didn't move to make any changes. So why would we expect uh, anything like that under, under a liberal government or a Quebec uh, prime minister? That's a great question. And, uh, you know, I was there for some of that time, obviously. Uh, I wasn't there for the majority. Uh, when you finally got the majority, I, I, I did predict he would get it in 2011 when I decided not to run again. Um, you know, things were complicated by the fact that the world was hit by the worst uh, recession and financial crisis, arguably, since the 30s, uh, when things collapsed in uh, 08 and 09. And uh, all of the attention, I, you know, I was working closely with uh, the late uh, Jim Flaherty, dear friend, uh, as was Stephen Harper and others, in terms of, of uh, addressing those types of issues. Those were huge issues. And many of those, we were in a time where, you know, all of a sudden we were uh, forced with challenging our own philosophic beliefs, like uh, government staying out of business and not getting involved. And all of a sudden in 2008, 2009, with, with literally the economy falling right out from under everybody's feet, we're asking the question, should we be supporting um, an auto manufacturing company. And, you know, we took a decision, which he later proved to be correct, uh, to, to for a short period of time to partially bail that out. So uh, those issues were really front and center uh, for so much of that time. That was a part, a partial uh, distraction away from possibly what could have been more could have been done at that particular time. Also at that time, we had, um, uh, governments uh, change, certain government changes in uh, Alberta, and you didn't have the NDP clamoring in Alberta as loudly as, as they should have either, not, not absolving the Conservatives on this, but there were gigantic issues that were diverting uh, what could and should have been a full attention to a, a more proper change. And some changes were actually made, which for a period of time were helpful. But in the wake of the devastation, uh, what happened in the oil and gas sector um, you know, all, all, all bets are off in terms of what those answers are. I just close out that thought, uh, Candace, by saying it, it, it is all, has always been a frustration to me that issues in Ontario, which should be addressed, you know, I, how many days, and uh, I would address it on public television and other places, you'd hear about um, a, a, a place closing in Ontario and there are going to be 100 jobs lost. And the entire federal government would, you know, stand up and say, we've got to save those 100 jobs. Listen, I'm, I'm for saving jobs. But when 50,000 jobs would be lost in Alberta, it was mute. And not just by government, but very little attention from media, which have mainstream media, with present company accepted, uh, very little understanding of the grief and devastation that was going on in other places. So these were the types of things that were swirling about a conservative federal government at the time that 
um, probably distracted from some of the focus that could have been there in terms of the equalization formula. Well, uh, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, those are good points, but it's it's still you know, disappointing that more wasn't done on this issue during that time. A, a question for both panelists. Uh, I, I wasn't really paying attention to politics in the 80s. I was a little kid, a baby. Uh, I don't think I was born when the national energy policy was introduced. But anyway, I know that that was sort of the, the, the first iteration of the Western separatism movement. So I was wondering if each of you could comment on the comparison of the sentiment in Alberta and in Western Canada back then uh, under, under the first Trudeau prime minister compared to what we have today under Justin Trudeau. Well, I'm um, thinking, go ahead, I can go ahead, Barry, yeah. go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I can remember the National Energy Program. I, uh, I uh, moved back to Alberta. If I had the, my 10 lost years were living in Toronto uh, when I was uh, teaching in York. Uh, but I moved back here uh, just in time for the, um, for the NEP. And I knew a lot of people who were in the oil business who, who uh, were um, really severely hit by it. Um, and I'll tell you an anecdote. When uh, Premier Lougheed uh, finally got into negotiations with, uh, with Marc Lalonde, in fact, um, and I heard this from people who were in the room, uh, Lalonde looked at him and said, we're here to negotiate. And Lougheed said, yes. And I want to tell you that independence is not on the table. And Mark Lalonde, who was not given to beatific smiles, burst into this beatific smile. And the meaning of it was, we got gotcha. you. Lougheed lost the negotiations right there. And uh, the, the icing on the cake was that famous picture of him that you won't <laughs> remember either, uh, of uh, sharing a champagne glass uh, with Justin's father. Uh, his um, profile in the oil patch uh, never recovered. Uh, and the, the point I, I, I make this because this, this uh, anecdote because it's, it goes to how important political leadership is. Uh, and it's, it, this, these are not sort of theoretical questions. Uh, they're not, of course, there are difficulties, but if you have decent political leadership, those are challenges that you want to meet, that you can overcome. Um, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm uh, optimistic that new Albertans, new Canadians uh, will be as open to persuasion as, uh, you know, the gnarliest old rancher from, you know, from uh, New Dayton. Well, your, your question there, uh, Candace, is, is pertinent because you've said, um, yeah, you weren't, you weren't there. And so uh, for a whole generation now, um, your age and, and, uh, and slightly younger, that's a reality. And what was it like then as compared to now? Uh, I do believe now in terms of the pessimism, in terms of the, of the crushing devastation, I, I think potentially it's even worse now. You've got COVID laid on top of it, which again is an area which uh, too many governments are just, uh, I don't know that they're handling uh, correctly. Uh, but in, that, in those days, the early 80s, I mean, I can remember this was, it was at its worst. And um, there were even, you know, uh, the federal government had exacted, was now exacting a 25% tax on all of Alberta resource companies, taking an extra 25% so that the government could open up their own gas station, uh, Petrocam. And I'll tell you, if ever there was close to revolution, it was then. So much so that there was a by-election in 1982 in an area not far from where I lived, and uh, an independent, like a separatist, uh, got elected, uh, Mr. Kessler. It, it, but even then, that only lasted two years. He, he did not survive or even come close to it in the election. Some of the polling was uh, below 5%, even in the wor those worst of times. Um, so the sentiment at that time was not as strong as it was. It wasn't anywhere near to being able to carry a vote um, a, a, as Barry would hope for. And uh, today, it just seems like 
it, it, I had the feeling that's worse when I'm in the, on the streets of, uh, of Calgary on one of my recent meetings there, not too long ago, walking down the street, I had to shake my head thinking, is, is this a Sunday afternoon? There just doesn't seem to be a lot of stuff happening out on the street. Um, and, and this was pre COVID. And then you look at the numbers and uh, they are completely staggering. This time is actually worse. And in spite of that, and with that, uh, I just don't think the years it would take you to move to get a, a vote to separate, I, I think would be uh, years lost and valuable energy lost in terms of improving our situation. And with respect to Barry's suggestion, uh, debt for land, um, you know, I've lived in Alberta and I've lived in PC now for a few years and I know the communities that used to be in my constituency. Uh, I used to love getting out to, uh, you know, to Hope, to Boston Bar and, and, and uh, to these places. I know the lower mainland, <laughs> Barry, <laughs> It ain't gonna fly. Uh, people are not going to give up their own their own homelands um, for that kind of a, a situation. So that that's my uh, answer to your very good question, Candace. I I think actually financially, and I think in terms of everything from economics to suicide rates, it's worse this time, which makes the complete and I'll use the word ignorance of the federal liberals in behalf of the pain in Alberta. It makes it even less excusable. Even with that, um, I don't think you're going to drive. I don't think you're going to get a successful independent vote. Let's do some of these other things. Let, 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 let's take these issues on um, and let's start to bring in the types of policies that in the past have shown can turn things around in Alberta. Great. Thank you, Stockwell. So let's let's move on to our closing remarks. We'll do five minutes each. And we will, because we let you go first for the opening remark, we'll, we'll go to you first as well, Barry. So let's hear five minutes uh, closing okay. remarks here. Um, okay, there, I, let's start again with agreement. There's, there's lots of room uh, for change, particularly in the government of Alberta. Uh, and it's true, we have been a model for Ontario once upon a time, uh, but it's a model that they uh, abandoned uh, fairly closely, uh, fa fairly quickly. Um, a second point, we can expect nothing from Canada, uh, even if they say they're willing to talk about equalization. It's, it's way too important for them to make any serious concessions. Um, of course, armed rebellion is, is not on the table. It would be impossible. Uh, the Alberta sheriffs uh, number about a thousand uh, and the um, Canadian forces has, have a fairly large base in Edmonton, so that's not on the table. Uh, but it never really was. Uh, that's why I said the assistance of the Americans, um, not for military reasons, or at least not necessarily for military reasons, um, but simply to whisper quietly in the ear of, uh, of Ottawa what is involved here. And we have plenty of military things to negotiate with um, with the Americans, uh, uh, Berkison, Dave Berkison, uh, in the in the book, uh, The Moment of Truth, explains some of these things. Coal Lake is the fourth largest air base in the world. Uh, Wainwright is is uh, an incredible facility. Uh, so is Suffield. Uh, so there are lots of things that, that we could uh, exchange in, on a military level that would be of interest to uh, to the United States. But armed rebellion by Albertans. Uh, I mean, I've got. Uh, I go shoot deer, but they don't shoot back. Uh, so that's, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, a fourth thing, and it is something I've, I've stressed before, uh, leadership can convince new Albertans, uh, First Nations, young Albertans, uh, that we've tried everything. And there's simply no interest in Laurentian Canada uh, to deal with our problems. Uh, Stock mentioned the government of Canada was mute over 50,000 Albertans out of work. I would suggest to you that this was not an accident. Uh, they have no reason to care about 50,000 Albertans out of work. Uh, we don't vote for them among other things. Uh, and then, Finally, I would say that eventually young Albertans, First Nations, new Albertans will learn how we have been historically exploited, 
how we are continually exploited. And the question that I asked myself when I answered it uh, with the position that I've been articulating here, how much are you willing to take? Ask yourself that. You know, that's the why I, I quoted that uh, second paragraph from the Declaration of Independence. Of course, there are, there are transition costs. Uh, and nobody likes, I've got friends in Ontario. Some of my best friends are from Ontario. Uh, but that's not the point. Uh, it's not a question of political theory. It's not a question of historical analogy. It's a question that every Albertan will have to ask themselves and have to answer it uh, in their own way. Uh, and leadership is the key to swinging public opinion or already that, I mean, Candace, you mentioned the support uh, for independence uh, in this province is, is high. It was higher than it ever was in Quebec. Um, the kind of leadership we want is, is not that which was supplied by Gordon Kessler. I mean, he's a, he was a great guy, but it, it will come. It will come eventually. And when it does, uh, I would say Albertans will be uh, prepared to act on it, to follow someone who says, we have had enough. The Germans have a wonderful expression of this. Enough is enough. Genug is genug. And uh, eventually we'll all see that. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cooper. And we will now turn it over to Stuckle Day for your final five minute closing remarks. Well, thanks, Candace, and thanks, Barry, some uh, great, great comments there. Uh, the wake up call is going to come, it, it's happened before. So, uh, I mean, one of the things, of course, uh, Winston Churchill said is uh, one thing we learned from history is that we don't learn from history, but I think at times we do. And when the federal liberal government, and I, I will say to a degree the previous uh, conservative governments, had raised the debt and uh, deficit levels to such an extent, and I can remember so clearly this happening in the early 90s, when the credit rating agencies of the world said, Canada, you're on the edge. You're about to go over the edge. You're about to get to the place where your borrowing is going to be seen as junk bonds. They actually said that. And we've got a whole generation that, that doesn't remember that. And I will say, uh, to his credit, it was Paul Martin, a federal finance minister, who went about the greatest restructuring of the federal uh, bureaucracy and its costs that have ever taken place, even more so at the federal level, um, because the, it was finally clear to people, this type of spending, this type of crushing the economies of other provinces just out of spite, it will imperil all Canadians. And it was then that Canadians started to listen to proper ways to finance and to handle um, debt and to handle deficit. Then people will be open to it. So that's uh, one aspect. I'm sure I'm afraid it's going to have to, it may have to come to that. The second is there has to be a change in terms of allowing more choices and getting more choices in terms of how uh, media is, uh, how news and media and information gets out there. Uh, I have so many friends in what I would call the mainstream media who are good and decent and smart and passionate people, but as a collective, only one side of a story collectively gets out. So uh, people in the media, and also I'm gonna say people in the corporate world who know better about some of these policies that come out of the federal government, but they're afraid to speak up because it could cost them their jobs or it could cost them share value. There has to be a reckoning where individuals, as proud Canadians as we are, and I don't want to see that change, we need to speak up. We need to say, this is wrong, whatever the policy is. There was a close with this thought. Um, there was a recent announcement in Alberta, I think it was two, less than two weeks ago. It was staggering in terms of what should have been the positive nature of it. It was the premier announcing uh, natural gas development that would allow for shipments of nat uh, natural gas to get to places like China and India to help get them off of their coal plants, which frankly are one of the greatest causes in terms of atmospheric pollution. Uh, right now, China has on its boards, on, on, on its construction planning, over 2000 new coal plants just to meet the demand, India in a similar way. And here was, here is a, an opportunity, Canadian product refined better than any other product in the world being able to go out and supported hugely by 
indigenous uh, First Nations investors and workers offering gen a generational hope in terms of what it would do for the indigenous community. And he held that press conference and I was listening, one reporter after another saying, uh, I don't have a question on that. I want to talk about this or that. And uh, where's COVID? And uh, why aren't people wearing masks? I was as staggered as I can be with the media at times. I was, let's call it super staggered. Um, my friends, they know better. And individually, in whatever profession we are, or walk of life, we have to start speaking up. And as David Frum once quoted uh, in a book he wrote some time ago, it's, it's, it, it's time we realized that we individually and corporately have to speak up, speak the truth, and be prepared to pay the price. Because there is a price to be paid when you're willing to speak up against a policy that you know is harmful. There's a price to be paid. I'm willing to speak up. I think others are. I want to preserve this country. I want to preserve Alberta as, as the incredible province it is. And to quote somebody else who said this, I'm not going to allow the federal liberal, liberals or Justin Trudeau to push me out of Canada. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much to both of our speakers. That was really excellent. And I think we covered a lot of ground. So thank you both. I'm now going to uh, invite the live audience to once again vote on the motion. And we will provide an update on those results uh, once they have been tabulated. We'll now end the, the live stream portion of tonight's debate. And we'll move over to the Chatham House Rules segment of the program, which means that we will allow our live audience to ha have more interaction with the, with the speakers and put their questions directly to them. And just as one final housekeeping note, if you're watching this and you're interested in joining one of these future sessions, these after hour sessions, please visit civitascanada.ca in order to apply for membership. We're always uh, open to new members. We would love for you to join the organization to participate. And if you're watching through True North, uh, please consider subscribing to our service, become a True North Insider uh, at tnc.news slash donate. And then you'll also have an opportunity to participate in these events. So we'll allow everyone to vote and see if people have had their minds changed and, and if uh, any of the, either of the debaters have been able to move that needle. So if you remember at the beginning of the night, uh, those in favor of the motion, be it resolved, Alberta and Saskatchewan would be better off independent was 64%. Those who opposed it was 34. And then now it looks like the, the, the needle has moved a little bit. 61% are still in agreement with you, Barry. But Stockwell, you were able to move the, uh, move the needle by 3% there. So uh, congratulations to both well our done, Stock. creators. <laughs> that was a great time. Barry, Barry, always just super to be with you. Good this time. has been great. I've, I've, uh, I've learned some good things here tonight. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Doc. Good seeing you again. All right, good to see you too. Bye now. Bye.